Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Chris. Good morning, Illuminate. It's a privilege to be here. Um, I feel badly for Jason this morning. I know what strep is like. I get it about once a year, and it's ugly. Um, and I'm sure the rest of you feel the same way if you get it. I want to start by th- this morning by saying something very simple. You and I are a lot like chickens. Did you know that? I learned this when I was uh, li- growing up. In, in the summers, I would spend oh, probably, I think I spent seven summers during my growing up years in Oklahoma. And my grandparents had a farm outside Oklahoma City in a little town that was famous for a federal penitentiary called El Reno. And uh, he, uh, he showed me how to, you know, raise tomatoes and pick strawberries and the whole business. But um, he had a chicken coop. And I learned a lot about chickens during those summers as I helped my grandmother and my grandfather take care of the chickens. And, and this is what I, I learned. First of all, uh, chickens and, and hens are, are very, or the, the chickens are very chivalrous. If you put 10 chickens in a coop and throw the food into the, into the chicken coop, the, the chickens allow the hens to eat first. I don't know if you knew that, but the hens always get first dibs at the food. And then the most amazing thing occurs. The, uh, the chickens start fighting to see who's going to get the first dibs of the food after the women have eaten. And so through a series of skirmishes, of pecking and, and, and screaming at each other, they form what is called a pecking order. And uh, you discover that the chicken that is the strongest, the loudest, the toughest becomes chicken number one. And then there's one below that becomes chicken number two. And they actually have a pyramid of, of, uh, of hierarchy all the way down from one. And we said well, there's 10 in the coop, so all the way down to chicken number 10. The interesting thing is that starting at the top and going down, you get to pick on all the chickens below you. Poor chicken number 10 doesn't have anybody to, to, to pick on, but the others all have their, their, uh, their way of being able to deal with that. Now take any 10 Christians, put them in a fellowship hall, spread out some tablecloths, throw some food on the table, and the most amazing thing begins to happen. They begin to talk about their families and their jobs and their kids and their Bible studies, and their knowledge. And sure enough, over a period of time, if you let it go long enough, there actually forms almost kind of a pecking order. Uh, We know in this church who's chicken number one, don't we? That's for you, Jason. (laughs) And chicken number two, chicken number three. Now, we don't cluck and peck at each other, but through through our comparisons with one another, we... We, uh, we begin to find our place in the church and we know those people that we think are more important than, than us or those that are less important than us. And all the time, we, we look to staunchly defend ourselves. I, I think the way, in big ways and small ways, we're always looking to defend our rights and we win by intimidating, showing off, proving that we're better than others. Oftentimes, we push for the first place. Uh, We want to make sure that our agendas are full of things that help us feel better, be better, do better. And uh, we take care of ourselves first. We see this how we, we see this in the way that we drive um, on the the road. Uh, We see this how we maneuver in the grocery line. I don't know about you guys, but God has got it for me when it comes to the grocery line. I can go to the shortest line and always end up getting out after the other people in the lines next to me. I can never get out right, right away. But I think I'm being smart by maneuvering my cart and getting into the shortest line. Um, we show it on how we handle the remote control in the living room, don't we, guys? Uh, most of us haven't even taught our wives how to use the remote control yet. And we feel pretty good about that. But our society is consumed with getting ahead making a way for ourselves. We talk about climbing the ladder of success, et cetera. And, and uh, w- when we're put in our place, we don't like it, and so we begin to push and shove. We feel left out. We, live past, we look past over. And the reality is most of us really know how to play the victim when we're put in our place, don't we? Well, in life, there's really only two ways to relate to one another. I want to think about this for a minute. There's only two ways that we can relate to one another on this planet. Number one is through manipulation. 
and number two is through ministry. You take any relationship you have this morning and you think through it. Either A, you're in the process of manipulating or you're in the process of ministering or serving. And I don't think there's any middle ground. I'm open to thinking that there might be a middle ground, but I don't think there is. And Jesus, in the text that we have before us this morning, I'll encourage you to open your Bibles to Matthew 20. Uh, the, Matthew 20, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. Um, Jesus deals with this in a very frank, direct, and wonderful way. Because at the end of the day, he's interested that you and I think about becoming great, about becoming chicken number one, but not on this planet, in his kingdom. And he gives us a very simple formula of what it takes to be great in the kingdom of heaven. Regardless of what your position is here at the church or at work or at home, there, there is a way to become great in the kingdom of God. And we learn about that through a conversation. In, in chapter 20, verse 20 of the book of Matthew, the mother of the sons of Zebedee, and we think she was Salome, who was probably Jesus' aunt, they're on their way to Jerusalem. Jesus is getting ready to be crucified. So he's sharing some last words, some things that are really important to him. And it says, the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? She said, say that these two, men, these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right and one at your left in your kingdom. And Jesus answered, looking at the men, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm to drink? And they said to him, we're able. He said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And when the 10 heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. <laughs> I lived in Argentina for five years, and uh, I learned the language in the street, so I learned a lot of things I probably shouldn't have learned and some other things that were pretty colloquialisms. Um, and, and there's a phrase in Spanish that goes like this. Che, me haces un favor? And you got to kind of sing it, because in Argentine Spanish, they sing the language. So it's, che, me haces un favor? Which really says, hey, you, would you do me a favor? Now, nine times out of ten, when somebody asks this, especially a child of his father or a friend of a friend, they're looking for something specific. You can probably guess what that is, right? Money. Hey, will you loan me some money? But in essence, what it is, it's a really close, familiar way of saying to someone with whom you're close, hey man, would you help me out here? Can you do me a favor? And I think as we, as we open up to this scene, this conversation, this woman that comes to Jesus is not unknown. Like I said, she's probably Jesus' aunt, so she knows Jesus very well. And her two sons have been walking with Jesus now for a long time, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. And so it's as if she's saying, Che, me haces un favor? Jesus, would you do me a favor? And so Jesus says, well, what do you want? And the answer is really simple. She wanted them to be great. Look at what she asked for. He says, well, what do you want? She says, say that these two sons of mine are to sit one at your right hand and one at your left, or in your case, one at your right and one at your left. She was asking that she was, first of all, she knows who Jesus is. She knows that he is the king and that he's going to be establishing a kingdom. And she wants her sons to be chickens number two and three in the coop of the kingdom. And so she says, Listen, let one sit on your left and the other one on your right. Normally in those days, a king would have at least two people that were strong advisors um, on either side of them sitting on the throne for important meetings. And the one that would sit on the left would be the, the person that we would probably today consider our national security advisor. He would be the individual who would give the, the king his counsel. This is what you should do. He's, it's a position of wisdom. Consider the wisest man in the, in the nation. The one that would sit on the right would be what we would call the joint chief of staff. 
he would be the one that, that held the, the keys to all the military might in the kingdom. So you can imagine, here's Salome asking her nephew, Jesus, when you get to your kingdom, can you put James and John on either side of you and let one of them be one and one of them be the other? She doesn't define who's wise and who's, who's strong, but it doesn't really matter. She's just interested that they be great in the kingdom. She couldn't help herself. She wanted her sons to be important. Well, Jesus answers her question with a question. And uh, Jesus said, uh, are you able to do this? Jesus answered, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? And at this point, he's not talking to the mother anymore. He's looking right at the boys. And he's saying, guys, you think you're able to do this? And their answer, of course, is, duh, of course I can. No problem. We got this handled. Having no idea what Jesus was about to go through and what they would eventually go through. Of course we're able to do it. And, 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 and he says, are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink, which is the suffering that I'm going to be that I'm going to be going through, the ridicule, the eventual crucifixion and death? They didn't understand at all. They were just had a vision of the chairs on either side of the throne of the king, and they wanted to sit there. Well, Jesus responds to them, and I think what we need to understand here is not only did mom want them to be great, but the sons wanted to be great. Of course we're able to do this. Now I'm going to skip ahead to verse 24 because there's an immediate reaction by the other ten disciples who were following. And it says, when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. In indignant just doesn't mean a little tort. Indignant means really, really, really angry. Can you guess why? You think it was because those 10 had it all down and they were so spiritual, they had this figured out? And they knew that, hey, these guys are off base. They shouldn't ask for that. You know, I think there's a 2% chance that I, that probably what was going on in their mind. But from my perspective, given the history that we've seen as the disciples have followed Jesus, they still didn't get it. And I think they were really, really, really angry because... The ten wanted to be great. So here we have a bunch of people wanting to manipulate themselves to a position of, of power. They understand the kingdom. They understand that Jesus is the king and that he's chicken number one, but they, they want to be in the coop somewhere very, very, very important. Now let's go back to verse 22. And Jesus says, you do not know what you're asking. Do you want to drink? Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? They said, we are able, verse 23. You will drink my cup. You will drink my cup. You will suffer. You will be ridiculed. And you will die. And as we know from church history, almost all of the disciples were martyred as a result of following Jesus Christ. So they were going to do it. But then he starts to turn their concept of greatness and leadership on its end with the next phrase. And he says, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. <laughs> What's he saying? First of all, manipulation doesn't work in the kingdom. Manipulation does not work in the kingdom at the end of the day. You try to manipulate your way up the leadership level within a ch local church or in the kingdom, show your superiority spiritually, whatever, it just doesn't work. It doesn't get you to greatness. Finding a position of, of power in a local church or the position of power in your home or the position of your power at work or position of power at school ultimately does not gain you greatness in the kingdom. Because first of all, you can't manipulate God. I'm sure that Jesus would have loved to say to Salome, you know what, that's a great idea. These guys have been pretty close to me and you know, they're, they, they, they kind of get it down now. So when I get there, I think I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna put James and John on either side. But he doesn't say that. He says, Salome, it's not mine to give. Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, the one who is going to lead the kingdom says to the mom and the, and the 12 that are watching, I can't do that. 
You can't manipulate God. It's for those for whom it is prepared. Now, we don't know who that, who, who's going to be at the right hand, at the left hand in his kingdom. I'm kind of excited to find out someday. Um, I don't think it'll, I'll, I'll be on one of those chairs. Um, and uh, it'd be really interesting to see who, who does. But you can't manipulate God. And then in verses 25 and, and 26, um, he basically says, you know what? You've got to root out all of your pride, all of your striving, all of your struggling, all of your clucking, all of your pecking. You've got to wipe that out of your life if you want to be great in the kingdom. And this, this is what he says. He says in verse 25, he says, Jesus called them to him and said. Now, that's an interesting phrase. Because you can imagine these guys are walking down the, the road together and they're talking and they, they run into Salome. Salome stops, asks him the question, and they're, they're stopped for a minute. They have this brief conversation. And then it says Jesus called them to himself. And he does this on several occasions in the text of the New Testament. And it's a way of saying, come here, guys, get in, let's huddle, get close. Because what I'm about to say to you is incredibly important. And these words that he's going to share, he's going to share in the next few verses are incredibly, incredibly important. And he says, you know, verse 25, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. Banish the thought. Don't think about it. It won't work. Well, what is he saying? Well, the, the great men, the, 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 the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over. They display their positions. They look important. They feel important. They act important. They point their finger. They demand. They, they want you to know, I'm chicken number one and you're all chicken number ten. Forget two through nine. I'm the most important here. Listen to me. Do what I say. That's true leadership to the rulers of the Gentiles. You do what I say or else. Or, at the same time, he says, and their great ones, the ones that are considered great among the Gentiles, exercise authority over them, meaning the people. They use their ability, their decision-making power to make decisions, to take actions, to have authority over everyone else, to keep them in their place and to keep themselves lifted up. In order to be great, you've got to achieve a position where you can demand and point and to stay there, you have to make decisions that keep you on top and keep everybody else below you. And, and even though it seems pretty extreme, th there's probably levels of that going on in our homes, in our church, in the church, in our school, uh, and, and, and even at work, where there are people that are striving to become more important, to have more authority, to make more decisions. And I'm not saying there's necessarily anything wrong with that, unless it's for the sake of thinking that by doing that, you'll become great. And so Jesus clarifies in the next couple of verses, once and for all, what is greatness in the kingdom. And he says in verse 26, it, not, it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Ministry makes one great in the kingdom of God. Ministry makes one great in the kingdom of God. This is an interesting word. You've all heard the term deacon in English, haven't you? Well, this is the word from which we get our English word deacon. A diakonos in the time of Jesus was someone who waited tables. He was a waiter. I did that for 17 years. I know what it's like. You can have really wonderful experiences and you can have some pretty ugly experiences depending on the people you're serving. But at the end of the day, your job is to serve those people. Well, what does it mean to serve them? It means to live to benefit them. To do whatever you can do to benefit another person. A diakonos, a minister, a servant, is someone who lives for the benefit of of someone else, not for themselves, but for someone else. And as I said at the beginning, either you're manipulating or you're ministering. 
So in our homes, either you're serving yourself or you're serving your spouse and your kids. At work, you're either serving yourself or you're serving your supervisor. At school, you're serving your teacher and your friends or you're serving yourself. And Jesus says, you want to be great in my kingdom? Consider yourself first and foremost <clears throat> like a waiter. Someone who lives to benefit others. And then he says in the next verse, in verse 27, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. You want to be chicken number one in the kingdom? You want to be chicken number one anywhere in greatness in the kingdom? Then you need to understand that it's sacrifice that makes one preeminent in the kingdom. Your greatness in the kingdom of Jesus Christ will be determined upon how you serve and dependent upon your sacrifice. <laughs> now, this word uh, in the original language, it's doulos. So we have diakonos and doulos. A doulos is one who gives his life up for one another or for another person. Now, in Jesus' day, there were two types of slaves, and oftentimes they thought that you could tell which kind of a slave a person was by the ring that was in their ear, whether it was in their left ear or their right ear. I don't know if that's entirely accurate, but I do know this. There were two types of slaves. Those were the, there are those slaves who were born into slavery who ab, had absolutely zero rights their entire life, and they lived to do the will of their master. Period. End of story. And if they got out of line, if they tried to run away, they could be put to death. But there was another kind of slave, and I think this is the slave that Jesus is referring to, and this is the slave, the person who put just a little bit too much money on his credit card, who got in trouble financially or lost his home. For whatever reason, there, there was more month at the end of his money, and he had no way to deal with it. And so he voluntarily chose to serve for an agreed-upon period of time as a slave to a master. Sometimes it would be seven years, sometimes it would be longer. Or if he owed the, the man a debt, he would voluntarily place himself as a slave for that period of time until the debt was paid off. Now, there wasn't as much right of the master to kill the slave if he ran off necessarily, but nevertheless, in both cases, a slave lived to do the will of his master. He didn't have a will of his own. He couldn't decide, you know what, I'm not feeling good this morning. I'm going to wake up a little late. You know what, the fields are going to be there tomorrow. I don't need to go out and work this afternoon. I'm going to just kick back and enjoy the sunshine. He didn't have those options. He did what his boss told him to do, his master told him to do, in the time frame that his master told him to do it. <laughs> being a doulos, being a slave, was considered relatively repulsive. It was like, how could you possibly lower yourself to do something like that? Especially among societies that in those days um, that really prized freedom. If you want to be great, you need to be a slave. Who in the world wants to be a slave? Who in the world would voluntarily choose the, to do that? Only the individual who sees the kingdom for what it really is, the kingdom of Jesus Christ for what it really is, and they decide, you know what, it's no longer about me. It's about you, and it's about you, it's about you, it's about you. It's about you, it's about my wife, it's about my kids, it's about my boss. It's about them, it's not about me. And you know what? I'm going to make decisions, conscious decisions to live to somehow benefit them. And I'm going to put myself at the complete and total disposition of my master, Jesus Christ. And I will do his will. Well, gee, Steve, where do you find God's will? It's right here. It's right here. Whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Verse 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. 
even though he didn't come to Diakonos, but to Diakonos, and give his life. Translation of slave. Slave gives his life to be a ransom for many. Jesus is our model. Why do we do this? Is it possible? I think it's possible. Turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. Because in Philippians chapter 2, we have the absolute expression of, of the model. Paul is talking to the, to the Philippians about some issues that are going on in the church. People aren't getting along. And in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, he says, Hey, would you guys just get on the same page, love one another, consider each other's interests as more important as yourself? Rough translation. Will you live to benefit one another? Will you start serving each other and quit manipulating one another? And then he says in verse 5, Have this attitude or mind among yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the very form of God, he did not regard equality with God something to be held onto, to be grasped like a a child clutches a, a blanket. But he emptied himself by taking on the form of a bondservant, a slave, and being made in the likeness of men with all of the temptations to manipulate and and go go for the top. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, that death on a cross. Result, wherefore God highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow above the earth, on the earth, below the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, gee, that's great for Jesus. I could never get there. Oh, I think you can humble yourself by becoming obedient and even obedient to the point of death through the Spirit of God. And the bottom line of this is is really simple. Those who are living to serve others, those who are living to benefit other people, those people who are living to do the will of Jesus Christ as they understand it through the scriptures, these are the people who will become great in the kingdom of heaven. You want to become great in the kingdom of heaven? You want to bring God the greatest glory that you can give him? Just think of two words. Take two words with you this morning. That's it. Servant, slave. Diakonos, doulos. If you don't remember anything else, just remember those two pictures if you can get past the chicken coop. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German theologian who poured out his life at the hands of the mercy, says it extremely well. The church is only the church when it exists for others. Not dominating, but helping and serving. Your home really isn't a home. It only exists in the way that Christ wants it to exist when it exists for others, not dominating, but helping and serving. We could spend hours in going through the scriptures, talk about the relationships between husbands and wife, where, where Christ says, Paul says that uh, through the Spirit of God, husband loves your wives as Christ loved the church and did what? Gave himself up for her. Sacrifice. And he protects her and presents her faultless and blameless. He's serving her to the point that she becomes everything that God wants her to become. Parents, don't exasperate your children, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Encouraging them, challenging them, serving them. Slaves, obey your masters. Employees, obey your supervisors. This is God's will. 
It's not about climbing the ladder. It's not become a, about becoming chicken number one. It's about becoming chicken number 10. And I would hope this morning that as we close and as we pray this morning, that that would be all of our prayers. That we walk out of here this morning committed to being a slave and a servant. We'd committed, be committed to being chicken number 10. Well, how can you do that? Well, let's keep a couple things in mind, first of all. Number one, this is Jesus' church. Illuminate is Jesus' church. I know some of you think it's Jason's, but it's Jesus' church. And I don't know if if Jason is chicken number one or chicken number five. Uh, That's up to, to God to determine that. But the fact is, you're here because God wants you to become great in his kingdom. And one of the ways you can become great in, in his kingdom is by serving in this church, coming and warming a bench and filling up the room so we can all look around and go, wow, this is cool. We got 1,100 people that illuminate after three years. Praise God. That isn't greatness. Greatness is when you're willing, when you walk down the hallway and you see the poor children's workers, many of whom are tired because they haven't had a week off in 12 And you could spend one Sunday morning helping with kids, serving them. Think about it. They always need help in the children's ministry. There's a lot of other ministries. You have spiritual gifts. You have a passion that God has given you. And this body doesn't grow. It doesn't become great the way Christ wants it to become great unless somehow you are involved in doing something other than warming the bench. Once again, bottom line, those who are living for the benefit of others, those who are doing the will of Christ, they are the ones who are great in the kingdom of Christ. Father, thank you for your word, and thank you for this treatise on leadership, which is so absolutely simple in theory, but man, how hard is it? in practice. Father, I, I confess my selfishness. I confess that I too often want to manipulate people and situations to serve my needs. And I pray that this reminder from the text through your Holy Spirit would cause me to come up with some really simple ways today to serve my wife and serve my family and serve my brothers and sisters. And I pray the same for those who are here. I, Father, Father, I pray for each and every person in this room this morning that you would do the same thing for them that I'd ask you to do for me now, Father, and that is to set my heart completely on you and your will for the sake of your Son, in whose name we pray. God's people said.